All right. So let's talk about measurement a little bit. So this is sort of a quick um, set of slides just to talk about sort of measurement, sort of what that means and how that applies to things. So the, the degree that my uh, doctoral degree sort of UCLA, when I was, when I first started there, um, was called, the program is called Measurement and Psychometrics. Psychometrics is a word that means psychological measurement. Psycho, psychological metrics for measurement. So it's funny because I remember even thinking back then that the program name was redundant. It was called Measurement and Psychological Measurement. So it's kind of a weird, but that's what it was called then. But by the time I was in my fourth year or so, they changed the the program name. The program was the same, but they changed the program name to um, Quantitative Psychology, which is a little bit easier to, to handle. By the way, so going through, and even now, people ask me, oh, you have a, you have a PhD, what, what is it in? And I have a tough decision at that point to make because if I say psychology, they're going to assume that I mean clinical. And then people get all weird. It's like they're like, oh, you know, don't analyze me or they're going to somehow, I'm going to figure out their dark secrets or something like it's magic. Um, if I say, oh, it's in stats, they assume it's sort of in math and it's a, that's a whole different set of, of, of assumptions people make. If I say that it was in measurement and psychometrics, they act like I'm speaking in a different language that they don't know. Um, if so, it's like every time I'm like, uh, you know, so I have to sort of be specific. Oh, it's an, I, it's usually easier to just say quantitative psychology, or I'll just say that I'm a researcher or something because it's easier. But psychometrics, I always thought was a cool term. It's like it's like what we're trying to do oftentimes is measure things in psychology. So psychometrics is this process of how do we go about measuring things that are sort of psychological that we can't really measure. And by that, I mean, we can't measure directly. There's not like a concrete, tangible way to measure most of the things that we're interested in. We want to know things about depression or anxiety or IQ or um, things like, uh, I don't know, uh, quality of life. You know, there's all kinds of, you know, the, these constructs that we're interested in measuring in psychology, yet none of them really exist in a tangible, tangible, concrete way. So how do we go about measuring things that don't really exist? So that's this whole process of this of measurement. How do we, you know, go through measurement theory and sort of decide if things exist or not? So I used to, I've done this, asked this question a bunch um, you know, of students, and it's always sort of a, a and I do it on purpose because it's an awkward question. So how would you def how would you define love so that you could measure it? And by that I mean you could tell if someone loves something, loves someone more than somebody else. That there's a way to quantify the amount of love. How would you do that? You have some ideas. How could you measure love? Uh, by the way, while you're thinking about that, I have a daughter that is nine, and uh, I was when I was sort of redoing these slides for for this because it has to have a black background and stuff. She read this and thought this was the funniest thing. Um, I've seen that a bunch before and I always thought it was funny. Love is like a fart. If you have to force it, it's probably crap. Anyway, I thought that was just something to go nice with this idea of talking about love. So how could you measure love? How could you quantify love in some way? There's no wrong answers. I'll only laugh at you on the inside, not on the outside. <laughs> Okay, so you can you can measure by how much time you spend with somebody. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just want to repeat what you said. What was the second part? All right, so physical proximity. So if that were true, most of the year, I probably love my students and more or work colleagues more than my wife and kids. So probably with them more, uh, you know, day, day to day. I'm just making a joke, but um, but that is one way. You know, how much time do you spend with somebody? Could be a way to measure it. It may not be the best way. It may not be the way that you intend, or it could be. It's possible that maybe that's all you really want. How else could we do it? Okay, so measuring serotonin when you're around somebody, looking at how much serotonin is uh, produced whenever you're around somebody. That'd be kind of tricky, right? Because you, you have to be like hooked up to an IV or have like a shunt in your brain or something to, to sort of measure the amount of serotonin uh, on, a, on a sort of regular, you know, active basis. But, but serotonin levels is right. But is serotonin, so serotonin is an interesting one because it's linked to lots of different things. Um, so it could be uh, love, but it could be a number of other emotional things that relate to serotonin, right? Um, 
Anyway, that's a whole other conversation. But um, but that is you know, changes in serotonin, the amount of serotonin relative to that person to another person is another way we can do it. How else? Maybe you're having a tough time thinking about it because you got that What is Love song stuck in your head now. What is love? Anyway, uh, I always picture Night at the Roxbury whenever I hear that song. I think of it. But... Nobody else has anything? So we either got serotonin or we got time. Nobody else has some big ideas on how you can measure love? So your the, the response was... Um, just, you know, define love in some way and then give people a sort of scale. This is sort of the weird, I mean, you're actually hitting on, it sounds like, oh, that's simple. But you just sort of, like, you know, mentioned the thing that psychologists and social scientists and all kinds of stuff just do all the time. This is this is what our, our almost like knee-jerk, you know, like fallback crutch that we use all the time. They're called Likert scales. You've probably seen them a bunch. Um, it's spelled this way. What we just say... Um, how much do you love, and then fill in the blank, right? So how much, let's say it's a question like this, how much, and then blah, 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 love. And then you can, you can have a blank and say, you know, like your mom or um, husband, child, you can just fill in different things. And it would be like, um, one is like, not at all, to, you know, and two, three, four, five, six, seven is like, you know, I don't know. Let's think about my son to the moon and back, whatever term you want to put at the very top. Um, something that my my mom, my son's grandmother, and my son used to always say all the time to each other. Um, so you you could create some scale where then people could go through and differentially rate different people in their lives according to how much they love, you know, and you can sort of then rank order them. You could even sort them. So let's say you have a car, you, you can take, these are there's different things you can say. This is like, all right, here's mom. Here's, you know, husband, right? Here's, you know, I don't know, dad. You can have a bunch of different cards. And you have to put them in order. Who do you love the most to who do you love the least? We have another way of measuring love, right? Wouldn't that suck if you had to do that? Um, but these are the kinds of things that uh, a lot of these sort of scales will do. They'll force people to sort of make these sort of decisions. Um, and sort of rank order things um, in this way to sort of try to measure a thing like love. All right, so what is the point of asking this question and make you think of this sort of complicated thing? This is what any sort of scientist is sort of faced with on a day-to-day -day basis because we want to measure all kinds of things, right? There, there's all kinds of, of um, phenomena that we are interested in trying to measure. Um, Right now, you know, uh, uh, because of the, the social context of things, uh, measuring things like racism, discrimination are a big sort of topic right now. And the way that racism and discrimination and stuff has been defined, like how we even define those constructs, has changed remarkably over over time from very overt forms, very, you know, visible, uh, visible uh, physical, um, you know, sort of overt, observable forms of racism and discrimination to much more sort of subtle um, covert forms. Um, so the, the even things like that, there's like a moving target for how you define certain things. So how do you go about trying to measure differences and sort of quantify things like that? And I worked when I was a grad student here, I worked with uh, a professor, Michelle Wittig, who was a social psychologist here uh, on a project where they had students going into high schools uh, around CSUN and doing uh, like prejudice reduction curriculum, trying to get kids to work together, uh, doing things like the, the blue eyed, brown eyed sort of things and the jigsaw classroom and just doing all kinds of activities to try to increase um, or I should say decrease prejudice, decrease discrimination amongst uh high school students of different races and ethnicities. So we were, um, we then had to sort of define what those things were and try to measure those things. And that was a very complicated process, trying to to really quantify different aspects like that. But um, I always go back to that thinking, you know, we have to do that with sort of everything. Everything that we want to measure, everything that we want to do, we have to figure out some way to measure it in some way. I just say it some way twice. We have to measure, we have to figure out some way to measure it so that we can quantify things and actually do the kinds of experiments we want. Now, this process, this idea of, of um, 
sort of measurement sort of sits in this weird area where it's sort of part statistics, but it's also part research methodology because this is really a topic that could be easily covered in 321 because it's really defining the pieces of the experiment of the research design. Um, but everybody has to go through something. If, if love is something I'm interested in, I have to figure out a way to measure it. And that becomes sort of complicated. So, um, measurement is, you know, most psychological phenomena do not really exist. Uh, so how do we study it? Um, there's, there's lots and lots of, I just sort of mentioned some of the phenomena studied in psychology. Like what kinds of things uh, are you, are, are any of you interested in sort of studying or going into um, in the field of psychology? What, is, what topics are you interested in? And just to give you some ideas of different types of phenomena that don't really exist and yet we try to study them. Something had to bring you to psychology in the first place. What are you interested in? Okay, neuropsychology. What in particular, like things like psychological disorders or um, brain trauma, what, what, kind, what kinds of neuro neurological things are you interested in? Okay. Yeah, there's actually a dementia clinic here on campus. Do you know that? <laughs> yeah, so um, the I don't know how, how active it is, to be perfectly honest, but the, the chair of our department, uh, Jill Rosani, uh, did, or I think still does, run a clinic to train the clinical psychologist to work with dementia patients. So yeah, it's actually run, I, at least it used to be um, run out of uh, Monterey Hall, which is on the very corner of uh, Zelza and um, Nordoff. Yeah, Zelza and Nordoff. <laughs> Uh, is that sort of brick building there? Um, there's a, they used to have a clinic that ran out of that building. I mean, I'm sure right now during the pandem pandemic, it's probably not running, but um, they, we do have a dementia clinic, which uh, our clinical master students and stuff are actually trained in those procedures. So think about dementia. Dementia is an interesting one because it has lots and lots of measurable components, being able, you know, not knowing uh, who you are, where you are, forgetting language, for, there's all kinds of things that go along with dementia. And we can even sort of point to structures and things in the brain that could be impacting dementia. But dementia is just a word that we, we have used to describe a cluster of psychological disorders, lots of things that go together. And so they don't, it's not something that really exists in and of itself. It can't just say, oh, this person's a 10 on dementia, this person's an eight. It, we, there's lots and lots of things that's very complicated, right? So that's why I'm saying that measurement's sort of a complicated process. So what else are you interested in, in, uh, in studying? What brought you to psychology? This is just me trying to get to know you a little bit. See what you're interested in. Got Mary, Haley, Valeria, Leslie. What brought you here? What brought you to psych psychology in the first place? It, was there any particular topic that you were drawn to the still by bi the biopsych stuff? Okay. So there wasn't any, in particular, you just liked the, the delivery of the course and things in, in biopsych as, as opposed to the bio classes you were taking before that. All right. Anybody else want to share? So it's like Kyle and Valeria have some, something in common, like both into sort of the bio psych side of things. Anybody else interested in stuff that's more clinical? Like you want to be a clinician, you want to be a psychologist. And by that I mean a clinical psychologist, but like a licensed psychologist. No one? Um, trying to think if there was anything particular back in the day that sort of brought me to to psychology I remember you know being really struck by uh, by social psychology and the, the stuff there and try to understanding people's behaviors as it relate to other people and understanding intergroup relations and stuff like that was a, a big interest um, of mine in sort of late undergrads early grad school um, I worked again with Michelle Wittig, and, and we, there's a couple papers we, you know, published around stereotyping and discrimination stuff. It was quickly after that that I, it was actually because of that project, I got involved in doing sort of large data an analysis stuff that sort of took me into um, the more quant side. 
But um, the reality is, I've sort of, I, I sort of found everything interesting about psychology. Just trying to understand people and understand how, how what makes people do the sort of strange things they do. So everything from abnormal psych, I mean, understand why you know people get depressed and they can't sort of get undepressed, right? You know, why can't we just decide to not be depressed anymore? Like, what what are the things that sort of lead to people having panic disorders? I mean, all those sort of clinical psychology things all, were all interesting interesting to me but i also like the sort of brain and behavior stuff too like you know how is it that neurochemicals and psychopharmacology and things affect the way that our brain works and why are certain people's brains sort of wired in a different way than other people's all those things seem fascinating to me and with everything i'm saying i'm talking about this stuff because all those things i mentioned depression i mentioned anxiety i mentioned you know things like um neurological disorders and all of those things don't exist. Like they don't, they're, they're not tangible, concrete things that we can just measure. I can't just take a tape measure out and measure it. Um, we have to sort of go about it in a roundabout sort of way. We have to figure out ways with which to, to measure those things. And that's what this process is all about. So the main thing that I want to get across in this, this slides about sort of measurement is this idea of operational definitions. So you see up here at the top, Dear Santa, I mean, I mean, if you're Christian or not or whatever, this is not meant to be a religious thing. It's just the the idea here. Please operationally define good. Love your friendly researcher. So what this is getting at is, you know, the the stories behind so Santa and Christmas and things are always about you know you have to be good in order to get presents, right? So good children get presents, naughty children get coal or they get eaten by Krampus or whatever, whatever version of that story that you like. Um, but it's never really stated. Well, what do you have to do to be good? Like, what you know? What exactly do you mean by good? What, how do I need to be a good child to get presents? Like, you know, th let's break this down into, you know, distinct details about what exactly it means to be a good kid. So this is the same process that we go through with everything when it comes to psychology. When we say we want to measure intelligence. All right, so we have this thing that we want to measure. All right, so intelligence is something that most everyone would agree is a, is a concept that we all sort of agree is real, right? People are more or less intelligent. There is some kind of intelligence that we can at least agree on to some point. We may not agree on the details, but this idea of intelligence seems to be something more or less readily agreed upon. But it's not a real thing. Like the, the idea of what intelligence is, is not a tangible, measurable thing in and of itself. So what do we have to measure intelligence? Well, we have things like something like IQ, let me know what IQ stands for. Nobody knows? It's probably a, a term you've used around, you know, thrown around before or talked about before. Um, it's meant to reflect intelligence, but it's not necessarily the same thing. What is IQ? No one knows? I'll give you a hint. The I stands for intelligence. <laughs> What's the Q? Yes, quotient. Now, do I know a spell quotient? Quo, nope, it's an O. Quo, quotient, I believe. So it's intelligence quotient. I look right. Hmm. It's one of those things where, like, you know, you say words, but then when you go to write them, sometimes you're like, that's a weird looking word. Intelligence quotient. All right. So, the quotient is a fancy word for number, right? It's just that it's a. We want to put a value on IQ, on intelligence. So, an intelligence quotient is really just a measurable version of intelligence, some way to measure it. So how do we get from up here? This is sort of, I'll write in different color. This is sort of this sort of metaphysical, um, can you read that? Yeah, metaphysical idea up here, right? We're down here, this is like, this is like the tangible reality. This is like 
how do we make this a, a real thing we can measure? We make that link with we go from here to here by doing something called um, well using something called an operational definition. Let me know an example of an operational definition of intelligence into an, an, an intelligence quotient. What's one way in which intelligence is operationalized this way? Anybody know? It's another way of saying name an intelligence test. Let me know the names of any intelligence tests. No? Well, you know, you have one that's probably been around the longest is something called the, the Stanford Binet. That's like, so that's sort of one, right? So one operational definition of intelligence is the Stanford Binet you know, has a uh, has a bunch of questions and uh, activities and things that you do, and that's supposed to then give you a measure of your intelligence. So one way in which intelligence is operationally defined is as the Stanford Binet. There's a lot of different ones. There's um, another one's called the WAIS, W A I S. It stands for the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. So it's just another operational definition of intelligence. So we're operationally, in, operationally defining intelligence as IQ, you know, as a, the sort of a sort of waste, which sort of gives us an IQ. Okay. The difference is here. Stanford Binet. This is like a side note. When it was really recently developed, was a bunch of questions, and it, it actually relied a lot on reading ability and comprehension. Um, so if you were um, trying to give this to someone in English who, whose first language wasn't English, that would hurt their, their intelligence quotient and make them seem less intelligent than they potentially were. Um, if someone didn't read, uh, like they, they were illiterate, they literally couldn't take the test. Um, so th this was um, highly you know, uh, reliant on reading comprehension. So the waste was developed um, to counter this and it requires less reading and has more sort of puzzle, um, nonverbal sort of uh, measures of intelligence. And later on, the Stanford Binet started to add some of those, and they're more or less sort of similar now. But the, the, they're just different ways of operationally defining intelligence. So we want to go from this, this metaphysical, um, I'll use orange here, this metaphysical concept to a more tangible construct where a construct and a concept are essentially the same thing. It's just a construct has, um, you know, has the, you're, you have the ability to, to quantify it. It has a scale. It is a concept that has been given an operational definition and you can measure it. You can put numbers to it and quantify it. All right. So, IQ quotient is more tangible. We actually understand, okay, 100 is average. They often have a standard deviation about 15. So if you're, uh, your IQ is 115, you're one standard deviation above the mean, so on and so forth. Um, it has a tangible, understandable sort of measurement scale to it, which turns it into a construct. A concept, it's just ideological, metaphysical sort of understanding of things, where a construct has been given an operational definition, therefore is more tangible and measurable. Questions about that? It's this process, this is the most difficult part of research often, is trying to figure out a way to operationally define a thing that is not really measurable in a way that everyone agrees, or at least trust that what you're doing really is um, 
that this thing down here that you're getting, this quotient, this number, really does reflect intelligence. If I have a high IQ, that really means that I have a high intelligence. <clears throat> right? So, it, you know, is this really a meaningful reflection of this thing up here? Questions about that? All right. Again, you know, stop me if if we, uh, you know, if we're getting ahead. Or if you have questions. All right. So you, you may or may not have come across the term sort of validity, like the validity of a study. And a lot of times people tend to use it to refer to like the trustworthiness of a study. And it really comes down to that a little bit, but it's really coming back to the sort of the accuracy of what it is you're trying to measure. So if I'm intending to measure something like intelligence, the validity of this study is how closely linked the construct I'm using is to actual intelligence. So validity is the strength uh, or accuracy of your operationalization. So how good a job you did operationalizing your construct is really referring to how valid the study is. So how well does the operation capture the phenomenon you're trying to, you know, to, to capture? And it really sort of is going to make or break research because I can do all the fancy stats, do the best manipulation, controlled experimental design. If you don't believe that I'm actually measuring intelligence or that, like if I use the Stanford Bernay, you're like, oh my God, I hate the Stanford Bernay. It's like the worst, it's just a horrible reflection of intelligence. You're not going to care what I do otherwise. If you don't believe that my operationalization really reflects the things I'm trying to measure, the rest of the study doesn't matter. Right? So this is an important part. It needs, there needs to be a valid sort of definition, valid operationalization of the construct in order for you to sort of really trust that they're measuring what they say they're measuring. Um, so I remember, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this one, but it, it, I find it funny because the first time, a long time ago, I was sort of teaching a course like this one, and I was like, oh, I should look up, you know, define concept in some way. So I looked up, you know, Google or something and found this definition of a concept, which is this sentence here, an abstraction formed by generalization from particulars. And I remember at that point, I read that, and I thought, well, up to this point, I thought I understood what a concept is. Now that I've read the definition, I have no clue. I, I actually think I knew less about what a concept was by reading this than I did um, you know, sort of beforehand. So what does this mean? The idea is that when we talk about something like intelligence, and you, you, you and I sort of use the term intelligence to mean roughly the same thing, that we, we think we're talking about the same phenomenon. But in reality, the way in which I understand intelligence has come from my experience, and the way that you understand intelligence has come from your experience, and that could be from meeting people that we were told were intelligent, or that we thought were intelligent, um, or seeing people do things we thought were intelligent things. And we've sort of, through time and sort of experience, sort of forged all these experiences together into this sort of loose sort of messy idea of what we think intelligence is. Which is why oftentimes when we ask people about many concepts, like what is love, something that we um, believe we understand and that we actually use all, you know, the term all the time and we think everyone understands it the same way, it's really difficult to define because we, it's hard to put the words because it really has to do with experience and this sort of loose assemblage of, of experiences that we put together. Um, so it's very hard to define. Oftentimes is is slightly different for different people because you've had different experiences. So what you think of as intelligent may not be the same thing that I think of as intelligent. And and people have gotten into arguments about, oh, that's not intelligent. This is really intelligent. And I mean, it's crazy because people have different experiences and different ways of putting those ideas together to create this concept. So a construct, on the other hand, is as soon as someone puts an operational definition onto a concept and gives it a scale and gives it a way to be measured and studied, it's now become a construct. So intelligence is the concept, IQ is the construct that we use to quantify a thing like intelligence, okay? Funny if I stand right here, it looks like it's my face. Check chance face. 
Anyway, um, so measurement equals sort of putting numbers to constructs. So this idea of measurement, right? So when we talk about measurement theory, I'm teaching a class uh, concurrently with this one on sort of intro to, to psych, psych testing or intro to measurement theory at UCLA in their summer session. And it's really this idea of talking about, okay, well, how do we do this? How do we actually put numbers and constructs? How do we make things sort of measurable? How do we sort of go about operationalizing things in a way that's sort of smart and um, really reflects the true nature of the thing we're trying to measure? Um, so the way in which we assign numbers to constructs is, is part of the operationalization but also it's gonna guide how we do our statistical analyses. So the different types of analyses are gonna depend on the types of numbers we use when doing the operationalization. This is where we get to this idea of level of measurement. So there, there are typically discussed in, in textbooks and sort of everywhere, they, they discuss sort of four different levels of measurement, okay? This sort of idea of nominal ordinal interval ratio and the process of measurement theory or sort of operationalizing things, right? really comes down to these four levels and each builds on on the last so ratio builds on everything that's an interval interval builds on anything that's an ordinal and ordinal uh, builds on everything that's a nominal so what's the difference so when we say nominal level of measurement what does that mean yes so that is like categorical so think we think about nominal level right with we're basically just sort of naming things so that's called nominal so we're putting things into categories and just naming things based on similarities. These things are similar, so let's put them into a category and we'll call it whatever. Um, you got you know, men care, you know, share DNA or share uh, chromosomes or whatever. So you know, we're them men. Women are in a different category, right? So, so it's a qualitative difference. So this thing tends to differentiate between things qualitatively. Qualitatively. Okay. We can assign numbers, which we often will do when we're doing uh, types of analyses to different categories, but those numbers are meaningless. They don't really reflect anything at all. They're just different, just a way of, sort of differentiating between groups. How does ordinal differ from nominal? Yep, so this really adds in rank or order, right? Which is, again, it's called ordinal, ordinal because you're actually getting an order to things. So one way of thinking about this is, so by the way, I, I'm going to say that this is sort of adding in rank or order. So this is adding rank and order to the properties that are in nominal. So ordinal data also differentiates between sort of categories, but it then also puts in order, which means that in order for things to have an order, there has to be sort of uh, more ness or lessness of things. All right, you gotta be able to talk about things in terms of, well, this is more than that, and this is less than this. So um, in order to have an order. So we can talk about sort of runners in a race in terms of order or ordinal. There's a first place, there's a second place, a third place, a fourth place. We know that the person in the second place took longer than the first in, the person in the first place and so on, but we don't know by how much. And the differences between each of the orders is not consistent, right? It could have been a millisecond between you know, first and second place runner, but it could have been a minute between the second and third place. There's really no consistency between the, 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 the orders that you have with ordinal. So with that being said, how is interval different? The difference between, the difference between values, what? <laughs> You're on the right track. No, so you had it right. So, so think about what I just said. The, with ordinal, we know there's more or less, but we don't know, but the differences aren't consistent. So with interval, the differences are consistent. Make sense? So this adds in sort of equal distance between values. So 
we know that it differentiates between things qualitatively. We, it helps sort of with rank, you know, order, more or lessness. But now we know that going from one to two, two to three, that the distance between those things are actually equal. There's the same amount between each of the values, They're equally distant. We can't say that about runners in a race, because that would mean they would, that every runner came in exactly the same amount of time apart from each other, which is not possible. So with interval, we add in that, that everything's sort of equally distant. There's a, a, the same amount of space in between. And then what's left? What does ratio add to the mix? So think about what a ratio is, right? If I want to say that, you know, that, uh, if I want to take four and I want to divide that by two to say that it's twice the amount, right? I want to be able to take a ratio like that. What actually has to be, what actually has to happen for that to be meaningful? What do we get this extra with, uh, with ratio we don't have a nominal or ordinal or interval because ratio has all this stuff plus a new quality what is that quality yes plus an absolute zero so sometimes we'll think people instead of saying absolute zero think of it as being a meaningful zero if you like it that way better that the zero has to be a meaningful number. So I'll give you an example. If go back to uh, you know the Likert scale, one, two, three, four, six, seven. And let's say this is disagree to agree. So this is some question like I don't know. I think it's something goofy. Um, you have a statement like um, uh, I don't know I I like you know the, I like the iPhone I don't know okay some statement like that you're supposed to rate how much you agree. Okay. Do you have an iPhone? You're asked if you like it. So someone's down here, they say disagree, you know that they don't like it very much. Someone up here at agree at seven means they like it, you know, quite a bit. Great. So we know that. We definitely know there's order. Someone down here, right, is above, has more agreement than someone down here at the bottom has less agreement. But are they equally distant? Do I know that the the change here is the same as it is there. And right, I might be able to argue this, you know, and say, look, I wrote the numbers essentially equally distant. And let's say that we all believe or agree that the change in agreement, an actual agreement from one to two is the same change in agreement from two to three is the same change of three to four, all right? So let's say we all agree that, with that, which is, by the way, is already tough. But can I say that someone who, someone who chooses six as their answer agrees twice as much as someone who answers three. Does a six agreement mean twice the agreement as a three agreement? Why or why not? There's two answers, either yes or no. I guess the more complicated part is why. So if I answered six, and let's see, Kyle, you answered three. Does that mean that I like my iPhone twice as much as you do? You would think so? So that's what I, your, your response is saying, yeah, you think it would mean that. It's what a lot of people would sort of think about this. But here's, here's the reason why we can sort of change this around. These numbers actually don't mean much of anything except for in terms of order because you'll see the exact same Likert scales written with zero in the middle, a negative one here, negative two there, negative three there, one, two, three here. And now all of a sudden, it doesn't seem like two is now three times one anymore. You know, it's the same distance. 
So we can sort of, you know, argue fairly well that there's an equal distance maybe between these numbers, but to argue that six in the number six really means twice three is rough because we don't have a solid anchor point. Zero doesn't mean anything. So we can, there's like an imaginary zero over here, right, that we don't see. But zero doesn't mean anything. I can actually use negative numbers here. It doesn't mean anything, right, because there's no sort of absence of agreement. It's just I either disagree or I agree, but there's no like absence of, you know, there's no absolute zero that means it's sort of absence of agreement. I can really put zero anywhere. Zero is just another number, it's another placeholder. I can use negative numbers and it doesn't affect anything. In order to, to have ratios that mean something, there, it has to be anchored at zero. Zero has to be something meaningful to give the rest of the values meaning in that way so that when we take ratios like six divided by three, we can say that that means there's twice of the thing that you're measuring. That's why zero is important. Um, there's lots of things where zeros, we use lots of things where zeros are meaningless, like temperature. Whether you're using sort of Fahrenheit or Celsius, with Fahrenheit, zero is sort of goofy, right? Doesn't, you know, 32 degrees is freezing, zero is below freezing. It's, it's sort of super confusing in lots of ways. With Celsius, zero is at freezing, but you can still have below freezing temperature, so zero is not meaningful in terms of an absence of temperature. The closest thing you get uh, with temperature is maybe Kelvin, where zero Kelvin means that particles, it's so cold that the, the particles stop moving, right? So you get sort of a, a, a real sort of zero down that sort of anchors everything. And now the values in Kelvin can, you can say are twice this. Because think about this, you know, when you, if you're on the phone with somebody who's, you know, somewhere else and you're like, oh, it's 40 degrees Celsius where I, where I am. You're like, oh my God, it's 80 degrees here. It's twice the Fahrenheit that you have there. It doesn't make any sense, right? It doesn't, like temperature doesn't work in that way where it's sort of twice the amount. That makes sense? Because it's not really anchored at zero. Those ratios don't, I mean, you can always take a ratio. You can all, I can always take six and divide it by two and say it's twice. But meaningfully, does it actually mean twice the agreement, twice the amount of the thing we're trying to measure? So one thing that, that is interesting about all this stuff is that I sort of separated these out. I'm going to erase this sort of example in the middle here for a second. I separated these out because we tend to treat data differently whether or not they're up or uh, you know above or below the sort of center point. By that I mean... We tend to consider numbers up here above. These are considered sort of more, um, uh, something's called like discrete, which I'll get to in a second. Um, and we tend to, to do analyses differently with these. We do things like chi-squares and um, called non-parametric tests. Okay, down here are our continuous variables. And this is where, you know, we tend to do our, you know, t-tests and, you know, ANOVAs and all the stuff we're going to talk about are the focus of variables that are measured either at interval or ratio level. The problem is a lot of things that we use in psychology and social science are things like Likert scales where it's sort of sometimes hard to really argue that they're fully interval. So um, I suggest there is a sort of a, a fifth category in here of what I like to call interval, interval-ish or you know, interval adjacent, because <laughs> it's not adjacent. It's not really interval, but it's sort of close. So with Likert scales and scales like that, we tend to say, all right, if it has enough categories, like seven or more choices, we can sort of treat it as if it is interval for a lot of these kinds of tests and they function fairly well. So even though they're not truly 100% interval in terms of being truly equally distant um, 
they're sort of close. They're interval adjacent, interval-ish, interval-esque. All right, questions about this stuff? Some other um, just definitions of things. We talk about variables and constants. And instead of thinking about some complicated sort of um, definitions, you know, variables vary. It means they take on multiple um, values, multiple uh, uh, types in, uh, in a context. So things like gender, you know, um, height, weight, I mean, things that anything that sort of has different values across uh, people you're measuring is considered a variable. However, any variable can be turned into a constant if you're if you don't allow them to vary. So constants don't vary. Variables vary, constants don't. So if I do a study and I choose only men, then I turn the variable into a constant by sort of only using one of the, the values of, of a variable. This happens a lot with things. Um, you know, uh, you can think of education. You do a study where you only use college graduates. So you now turn a variable of different levels of education into a constant by choosing just one value of a, of a variable and using that as a constant. Okay, so the context matters. Things that are variables in one context may be used as constants in other contexts. So it really, you know, the context of it matters and you really have to understand that. Um, one, one source of great pain for many people in, um, in studying research methods and stuff is this idea of independent variable and dependent variable. And you'll see all kinds of different definitions about where well, independent variables are the thing that you manipulate. Uh, it's the cause and a cause and effect relationship. It's, um, I mean, all kinds of things. The problem is if you're doing an experiment, then that's totally true. Um, the thing that you're manipulating in the experiment is the IV. But if it's not an IV, I'm sorry, if it's not a, an experiment, then that, that definition gets a little weird. So yes, it is the cause and cause and effect relationships. It's the thing we think of as the inputs, the things that we're putting into the experiment. It's the thing that's being the influencer. It's the instigator, the predictor. It's the thing that's sort of doing the work. It's the thing that's actually making the change, or at least pre you're predicting to make the change. Well, the dependent variable in a cause and effect relationship is the effect. It's the thing that's actually being changed. It's the output. So you put stuff in the input. What comes out of the study then is the dependent variable. It's the follower to the independent variable. It's the thing that's being predicted. An easy, easy way of thinking about it is when you have variables, right, like x and y, generically, okay, if you think the flow of information is going from, I think, x is predicting y, or influencing y, or causing a change in y, then x is the iv, and y is the dv. If, in a different circumstance, the same variable y is thought to affect the variable x. Right, so you think in some other scenario that y is influencing x, then this becomes the iv and this is now the dv. And so it all depends on the sort of flow of information in the study. What is influencing something else? The thing that's influencing is the iv, the thing being influenced is the dv. What if it's we have something like this where I, I just think X and Y are related to each other. So there's no flow. It's just I, I have these two variables. I think they relate. Well, in that sense, you don't have an IV or a DV. In this scenario, there is no IV or DV. This is just uh, you know something like correlation where we're looking at variables and how they relate to each other without there being a flow of information, without there being some influence from one to the other. In this sense, there is no IV and there is no DV. They're just two variables that are related. That's it. Okay. So let's think about the flow of information and what is influencing something else. And you should be able to, so anytime you're reading like a description of, you know, some research or something and, and then, it's, then you're asked, what's the IV and what's DV? You think about, okay, what is, What's the flow of information? It's going from, okay, it seems like it's going from this 
to this other thing. So then the first thing is the IV, the second thing is the DV. All right. Keep on going. So I mentioned discrete and continuous variables um, before. Um, I should probably change this picture because a lot of you probably don't even know what the hell that is anymore. But um, actually, that being said, you probably don't know. I've never seen one of those either. But um, I still have a an, an actual iPod. I think it doesn't work anymore. I, think my, I gave it to my daughter when she was young and she used it as like a toy. But um, it stopped working. Anyway, so discrete versus continuous has to do with the your ability to sort of break down values into smaller and smaller chunks. So discrete variables have limited sort of whole values. So when you look at a, a digital clock like this, you're not able to get past the minutes to get into seconds or milliseconds or any further sort of smaller increments. So therefore, it is considered um, essentially discrete. Right? These are discrete numbers. You just see when the minutes change, that's it. Same thing. The reason I put your this iPod here or your phone or any sort of MP3 player uh, could replace this picture here. The reason I put that there is because of the difference between digital and analog music or sound in general. Digital music actually has holes in it. It actually has information that's removed to make the file sort of smaller. And our when we listen to it, we actually hear it as continuous sound, but really it's just uh, a series of sound, silence, sound, silence, back and forth. So um, digital music is really discrete. It actually is missing a lot of information. It isn't a continuous sound, but a sort of a, a series of, of sound bits that uh, you're hearing sort of in succession. The same thing with watching a movie. Um, you know, regular reel-to-reel -reel movie or even a digital uh, movie, you know, you're, you're being shown flashing images at a rate of, I think it's like 20-something frames per second. Um, so you're seeing a continuous image, but really it's a series of discrete images. Now you get to something like continuous as a contrast, it's like a stopwatch with a, with the second hand here, or the, you know, you get down to even smaller increments. Um, is considered more continuous because you can stop it and break down the time into smaller and smaller increments down to milliseconds and smaller things like that, as opposed to a digital clock where you can't do that. Back in the day when we used to record on reel-to-reel -reel tape like this, this um, this is sort of uh, the analog you know version of sort of music where things were recorded on tape or on records that were actually considered analog. And people there were people to this day that will spend extra money and funds like the, like like vinyl records have actually had as CDs and stuff have sort of die or been dying. Vinyl records have actually come back around and, and the market sort of grown somewhat. People going back to this idea of sort of analog, sort of fully formed uh, music that has all the sounds and all the, all the stuff there without losing any information, sort of a lossless format. Anyway, so because it's, it's recorded reel to reel, the sound is con recorded continuously without there being missing components. So it's considered sort of continuous sound. Um, the precision makes a difference because at some point you can get a discrete scale that has enough precision that it starts to function like a continuous scale and it's often sort of relative where something is more you know, continuous relative to something else but in another condition that same thing would be cons considered discrete. So there is some relative uh, comparison that goes on there as well but just to give you an idea of sort of discrete versus continuous and again the discrete variables we tend to treat with things like chi-squares and um, well, Cox and rank sum tests and all these sort of non-parametric tests where continuous variables uh, like interval ratio um, measured variables we tend to treat with things like t-tests and ANOVAs and assume normal distributions and all these things. Um, another, just some other um, things we talk about sort of populations and samples. Um, you know, populations are, you know, large, sort of infinitely large to, to a certain degree. And, you know, the, anything that we do relative to the population is called a parameter, population parameter. Um, and the whole point of a class like this one where we're talking about inferential statistics is this idea that we're going to take a large population like this we're going to take a sample out of that population and create a small version, a small version of the larger population, and we're going to do stuff to them. We're going to manipulate things. We're going to do experiments. We're going to give them surveys. We're going to do whatever it is we're going to do in, as part of our study. And whatever we do to them, whatever we measure about them, is called a statistic. 
All right, so parameters are for populations, statistics are for samples. But the goal in the end is to then infer meaning back from this group, the group that we actually have access to, back to the population. I really want to know what's going on with these folks. All right, I'm interested in studying cancer. So I take some cancer patients, cancer folks, people with cancer, study them, do give them drugs or um, you know, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, whatever I'm doing to them, so that I can infer back how those things would affect the larger population of uh, folks diagnosed with cancer. Okay, so this idea of inference is really referring to how do we go from this people that we have and can access back to the larger population. Okay, population big, sample small, but the sample is supposed to be representative. And a big part of what you learn in Psych 321, the sort of research methods course, is how do we get samples from a population you know, to our study in a way that makes these folks the most representative of those different kinds of sampling methods like random sampling, simple random sampling, cluster sampling, all these different things are trying to figure out a way to make this as much like that as possible. Um, like, you know, I just mentioned before, there's this, this idea of sort of random process, the, the process of getting folks into the sample, right, to go from, from the population to here is the process of random selection. How do we randomly select folks to make sure we have representativeness of the population? Once we have them and we want to do stuff with them, like um, do a treatment versus sort of placebo or treatment versus control group or have multiple treatments, how we separate the people into different groups is called random assignment. And the idea there is we're trying to create groups that are as equivalent as we can to one another so that the only differences between them are whatever it is we're doing to them. Um, that you know One gets a drug, the other one doesn't. But everything else about them should be the same so that we can conclude that the drug is really making the difference in the end. Okay? And we don't have to go through this, but it's interesting to just to we're going to get more and more into this idea of sort of going through different things that are, are referring to sort of Greek letters, where we use uh, sort of Latin letters like X and Y and things like that. X and Y, the capitals refer to the variables themselves, where, where the one, the like lowercase, refers to individual points in those variables. Uh, Greek letters we're going to use to refer to population parameters and other things like that. Not always, because sometimes it not always works out that way, but like this sum, this sigma means sum, and uh, this sigma is actually referring to population standard deviation. So there's different uses for this stuff, um, and so we're going to use you know, some Greek notation for that. So just being familiar, that's alpha, beta, this is lowercase sigma, this is uppercase sigma, this is eta, that's rho, and this is chi. So we're going to be using these here and there. And these, you know, whatever, this doesn't matter. These are just sort of rules that have, you know, if you remember PEMDAS, right, that, that anytime you have parentheses, you get to do the parentheses first. You're going to sum X and then square. Well, without parentheses, I'm going to square everything first and then sum. Maybe basically stuff like that, just remembering sort of rules and things. 